I don't even know that they not to say that they were rude and they did not acknowledge him, but it was as if like it was like, okay, he's over there doing <laughs> He's doing the same guy. <laughs> Camera guy, gold camera, yeah. <laughs> he did interview the the um, women because when Brooke got there, mm-hmm. it was almost over. He got there probably like 12, yeah. which we just didn't time it right. Like, mm-hmm. I didn't know that it's we were going to be rushing the door at 8 o'clock. So. It's your first time, yeah. yeah. Well, not 8 o'clock. They rushed your door at, at 7 30. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's set up on a Saturday. Yeah, a Sunday. Yeah. Sunday. Oh, my bad. Yeah. On a Sunday. Yeah. So Mm -hmm. I think it was good that he was able to um, interview the people, the women that were there when it wasn't as busy and Mm -hmm. hectic. Mm -hmm. I think that was that was a good benefit of him coming at 12. Mm -hmm. Um, And then he also got to hear the conversation amongst the women, which I think is important for black men. I'm not even sure if Brooke is. Is he black? Oh, he black. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's killed. important for black men to mm-hmm. understand the black woman's perspective because there's a lot of misunderstanding and miscommunication between the sexes. Like, mm-hmm. you know, this perception that black women are angry and bitter. It's like, no, I'm misunderstood or I'm not seen or, I'm, yeah. you know, when I, when I see the black woman in the establishment who is going off and getting loud. Mm hmm. It's because she, I think it's because she is fed up and nobody has listened to her the 10 times that she has said it nicely. Yeah. Yesterday when I was watching, I remember that you said that like, oh, instead of doing like back to school, because that's preparing them to go back to work, mm-hmm. we should prepare them for relaxation and just like back at the end of the school year, you just come and get your hair done. And like, you know, I brought up maybe teaching them how to how to do hair. And you were like, oh, isn't that like corporate thinking? I'm agreeing with you. Oh, okay. It's just your eyes are still getting excited. So I'm just waiting oh, to I'm see what you say next. Oh, I'm excited because yeah. I think that is a very good idea. Mm-hmm. I would summer. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I would want to do that if, yeah. next summer if yeah. possible, um, well, and then work up to the like back back from winter vacation. What we should do is, you know how the scammers usually like they pitch things. They'd be like the corporate stuff and blah blah blah. We should be like we we got the two S system. Back to summer, back to school. Like right? we get them out the way, and yeah, no, nah, that would be. Now we could do that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I love it. That's great. I and have if, so we, many. if we could do multiple days and locations, that yeah. would be crazy. Because you already had that line out the way. Like, when I was talking to my guy about it, he was shooting the idea down immediately. And this is my man that's cut my hair. And I'm like, see, that's why this isn't your job. Why was he against it? Because I, I hit him up and I was like, hey, would your barbershop be open to it? He's like, nah. They want to be open to it. They about their money. I'm like, you know, get out of the mud. I appreciate that. You know, at least I know who you guys are, who you're not. That's fine. I'm still going to come here and get my hair cut. Mm-hmm. They get me right every time. <laughs> but then when I told him about what you did, I told him, I was like, you know, you guys got like 15 girls out the way. And I was like, you know, it was like a three to four hour event. He's like, nah, three to four hour event. Anytime women get their hair done, that's like four hours per woman. And I was like, nah, that's not how it works. He's like, I mean, if that's the case, you probably getting like seven. And I was like nah 15 but it's the fact that you're leading with no before we've done anything like fam this isn't your idea Mm -hmm. you don't get to dictate whether the person's idea is going to be successful or not right even if you care about me you telling me no or telling the person who's coming up with this no that's not good reinforcement if someone's going to fail let them fail they'll figure out whether they want more failure or whether there's a better way to do it Mm -hmm. or whether this is it for them Mm -hmm. but telling me no or the person no i'm like no we did it she has proof she did a great job (laughs) like like no matter your opinion or your experience when it comes to women getting their hair done that doesn't dictate that someone did this and that there was a young girl who was crying because she was so happy that someone put this event together Mm -hmm. to get her hair done before school Mm -hmm. and that she was going to be a mess. You you can't take that away from her. So it's just like, yeah. And then he gave me a good resource. So I was like, look, if you're saying no, but you're able to make a good suggestion, you keep saying no. That's fine. As long as you follow up with a great suggestion. Yeah. What was the suggestion? 
the um the school I told you he told me to oh, reach out school, to yeah, for yeah. the folks who could do the yeah. haircuts and stuff like that. Yeah. That are working on like their certs and everything else. And I okay. was like, I'm just bad. Yeah. <laughs> I'll take that no any day. What was unfortunate is that I tried to get the students of Dudley to participate and like they all had a reason why they couldn't or wouldn't. I got some yeses at the very beginning, like at the beginning of planning and then that was the, the week before hit you up on it like, was like, Yeah, no, I can't do it. Yeah. And they ain't got nothing to do with you. No, it doesn't, but it's just like... It affected you, though, at the moment in terms of what you were hoping for in the event coming together. I think that affected me because it was last minute. You could tell mm -hmm. me, no. Just say when I asked you the first time, like, no, I'm not going to do it. Yeah, don't... You know, and then on top of that, I wanted to be more engaged as the founder and CEO of Raising Risers, but instead I'm braiding. Like, I can do it, but I would have preferred to be boosting the brand a little bit more. Yeah, but that's not bad. Mm. That's not bad when you show the community that you're willing to get your Can't your see. hands dirty. Mm -hmm. And I think that's that, that could be that could be something yeah. that's like really positive to say cuz like I like hearing you say, "Well, you know what? There was one person who came late and I said, "You get your head in a bowl." <laughs> let's, let's watch this hair. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, yeah, that's not, that's, that's dope. Yeah. That's dope. Yeah. But uh, welcome back to another episode of Mental Health Monday here with my host, Jory. Hey, everyone. I'm this Dr. Is, Jory, Dr. Jones. I mean, you prefer Jory. I said I do Dr. Prefer, Jones is a title. Yes. So folks know what's up. Yeah, I do but prefer you, Jory. All right, Because cool. I'm Jory in my real life. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, is it, is it real? No, 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 no. You're right. You're right, actually. Professional life and real life is a little bit different. I'll take it. I'll take it. But, um, all right. So tell me about your week my week has or been let's say two weeks two weeks yeah because yeah. it's been two weeks since you did that event yeah right? so it was two sundays ago mm -hmm. actually mm -hmm. um i hosted my first back to school braiding event mm -hmm. at dudley beauty college and it went better than i could have ever expected what did you expect out of the event and what happened at the event i expected girls who are going back to school to come and get their hair done. Mm -hmm. What I got was that, plus the girls got book bags, mm. plus the girls um, showed me in the moment the impact that I was having, which is not something that I experienced in my day job as a, as a pediatrician. And so that was really rewarding. Mm -hmm. um, There's a hole in my sock. I just looked down and saw there was a hole in my sock. <laughs> I'm sorry, keep going. Uh, <laughs> and then on top of all that, there mm -hmm. was a conversation that um, was ignited amongst the women in the shop. So these are mothers waiting for their daughters to get their hair done. These are stylists. These, uh, the instructor of the beauty college participated in the discussion. Mm -hmm. And the discussion started out with the women sharing their birthing experiences. Um, and then led into how they are healing from trauma while raising children and what that looks like. Um, and then led into why black people in this country are still in the same position after several decades, even centuries, if we want to go that far. Um, are you referencing that one lady or no? Kind of. So, so bootstrap. Let's, let's, let's touch on bootstrap. <laughs> I just want to get straight to bootstrap. I feel like that's, that's a really yeah, important yeah, yeah, moment yeah. right there in the whole thing. We'll get back to the event, but bootstrap yeah. is really important to me. I think, And that was so yeah. organic because it's easy to have a conversation when everybody is in agreement, mm -hmm. right? You're all saying the same things and the conversation is probably a little short. Yeah. But when you have this dissenting opinion, this mm -hmm. woman... Uh, I define dissenting. <laughs> um, an opinion that's opposite of the popular opinion. Mm -hmm. um, so contrarian would be a good example of that word, or...? Um, I feel like a contrarian mm -hmm. just wants to disagree. Okay. Dissenting opinion, you actually believe what you're saying, yeah. and you don't always disagree. You can probably find points where you can understand the other person's point of view. I feel like a contrarian is just ready to argue, just like, no, 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 mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> no. No. Uh, <laughs> no. <Nah. laughs> nah. <laughs> Felt that in your soul. <laughs> Felt like when you said that, you were thinking of a very specific person. No, no, no. I said, oh, that person has worn you out. Huh? 
I got you. I got you. <laughs> but um, this woman um, shared her background. So she's half Middle Eastern, half African American. Mm -hmm. um, I think her dad was is Middle Eastern, and her mom is African American. Mm -hmm. Not very exactly proud. sure. She was very proud. Where, what part of the country she's from? Mm -hmm. But her point was. My dad came to this country with nothing and he was able to start a business and he built his family up and he has all this wealth and all that, like, why can't black people do that, that same thing? And the other women in the, in the salon were kind of saying like, hey, you can't just ignore the centuries of trauma that exists in this culture and tell them like, hey, just make the right choice or just get it together because you know you need to do better. It's like, no, like, I had a conversation with this person yesterday because she generously donated a car to, to Raising Risers. This is the same person? Same person. Wait, so Bootstrap said, hey, I have a car for you? Yes. Wait a minute. <laughs> so this hustle and bustling we've been looking to do is Bootstrap? Bootstrap might have to come on the show. Call her bootstrap. I'm gonna call her Bootstrap from now on. She may need to come on the show. I, <laughs> I'd love to have a conversation with her. She, all right, so I feel like I'm interrupting your flow. Yeah. So I was saying yesterday, mm -hmm. I actually went to see them because I wanted to get the title and everything for the car. And she and her husband were engaging me and my um, public relations director about the same thing like mm -hmm. I guess her husband is a homicide detective oh okay in DC and okay. so he was kind of just saying like you know the people need to make the right decisions I see the same people going into the system over and over again um, and you know he agrees with the three strike rule like you know if you have three felonies then you deserve to be locked away for the rest of your life mm -hmm. and my I, I brought two examples one was like okay let's say that I have a patient, I'm seeing a patient at work, and the patient's mother is 15, mm -hmm. the patient's grandmother is 30, the great-grandmother is 45. At what point are they going to have the insight to say we need to do something different? Because these are all adolescent mindsets raising families, right? And so I think that's where Raising Rogers comes into play because we're trying to teach people who don't have access to that other perspective a new way of life, right? Like filling in the gaps. Maybe my patient can learn a different way than what his or her grandmother, mother can offer. Um, the other example is he was saying like, you know, the three strikes rule should be legal and continue. And I was saying like, okay, let's say a kid robbed, robbed somebody because they are hungry. A robbery is a felony, right? And so you send that kid to a, a prison and now he becomes institutionalized and acts as if he's an animal because he's been treated as an animal because he's caged 24 to one or whatever. And when he gets out, he commits another felony. It's like he's not received any rehabilitation. And so how can you expect him to do something different than what he's been, been conditioned to do? What was his response? Um, he didn't care. He was like, yeah, I don't care about rehabilitation or anything. He's he's violent. He, he shouldn't be hitting people over the head and robbing them. Like, so you don't want a solution. You just don't want the problem to be yours. Yeah. That's, that's what it really comes down to. That's why with that thinking, it's like I get where you're coming from, but if you're going to say it out loud or if you want that, that means you should technically be willing to look at the entire picture of what happens. Mm -hmm. Now... With this culture of robberies and teens doing wild stuff left and right, yeah, I can see why people are more inclined to be like, oh, three strikes, you out. That's it. Because it's just like, fam, like, folks getting shot because people are breaking into their cars and they're breaking for trying to get their cars back so their cars aren't stolen. Mm -hmm. Especially with the way insurance and everything else is going up right now. Yeah. It's like, I, I can see it, but that doesn't make that mindset right. Yeah. Because it's like... You being overexposed to the worst in the system doesn't mean someone who hasn't become the worst that the system has to offer deserves what everyone else is getting who has become the worst the system has to offer. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what your point is. Because yeah. it's like, what does rehabilitation look like? Like, if you could say three points of rehabilitation, what would be your three concerns? Um, 
Well, people are not treated as human beings. They mm-hmm. are treated as caged animals. That's one way to make sure that somebody continues to do the same thing over and over. If you if you treat people the way that you want them to behave, mm-hmm. you will see a difference. I watched a doc- documentary on Netflix called Unlocked, where they did this experiment in Arkansas, and they opened the doors of the of the um, cells. Oh, I saw that the commercial right. for that. How was that? Yeah. It was very... Um, there was a lot of tension in the beginning. There was a lot of tension in the beginning, but it was very inspiring. It was just like, these men are people. Like, we, we demonize black men as if they cannot participate um, or communicate effectively in society, but that's not true because, yes, there was tension. They had to recover from being caged, but after a while, they created their own rules and obliged by them. It's like, okay, everybody's fighting over the phone. Well, we're going to make a list. And when is your turn to get on the phone? You get on the phone and everybody follow that rule. Like, I mean, that's, that's basically what we're asking them to do out in the real world, and they got to that solution on their own. So mm-hmm. why not give them the opportunity? Yeah. Um, while they're rehabilitating, right? Mm-hmm. Um, teach them something. Okay. A lot of times, the prison to pipeline—I mean, the school to prison pipeline—conditions black boys to believe, you know, they are incapable of achieving, right? So if you're labeled with ADHD, attention deficit disorder, um, or you are labeled as a behavior problem, and you're getting sus- suspended from school once a month, or you know, every week. Why would you think that you need to try or like that you need to achieve in this environment? It seems like the people that you are encountering don't believe in you. So you don't believe in yourself. If if you're in prison, if we create an environment where people can learn and like, you know, get something out of their education, like, okay, you went to prison, but you came out a barber or you went to prison and you came out an IT specialist, like imagine how easy it, well, that goes into the third thing. It's like, once you get out of prison, Let's welcome them back to society instead of shunning them and making them feel even more like outcasts. That, you know, they probably felt like outcasts to begin with, which is why they committed crimes. And um, then um, I think another point to add on is when you go to prison, the longer you're in prison, the more you adapt to that environment. Mm-hmm. So it's very hard to adapt to a softer environment that's not prison because you're expecting tension, you're expecting betrayal, you're mm-hmm. expecting I have to play this role and be hard at all times if I want to survive outside of prison. Right. Because if prison did that to me, going back to the world that put me in there, mm-hmm. I now have to be harsher to that world now that I'm back. Yeah. And unlearning that isn't easy for anybody. Right. Yeah. The other thing is like there should be a gradual transition, right? Like mm-hmm. you can't be caged 24 and 1 and then when you're free from prison now you're out in the world where there's overstimulation you got like cars buzzing I mean beeping their horns you got people coming in and out of restaurants walking up on you even if you go to a restaurant somebody walking up on you Mm -hmm. from behind and asking you what you want to order that could be threatening like if you come from a prison environment so like kind of like re-socializing them into society Mm -hmm. I think that would that would probably go a long way I like that you get to yeah. talk more about the work you want to do with raising risers and why that work is important mm-hmm. all off of the story of someone donating a van. <laughs> <laughs> like that really shows the layers to like mm-hmm. the work that you want to do because mm-hmm. like I think my work is very argumentative. Your like, work is argumentative. Yeah, the work that get home safe wants to do and accomplish mm-hmm. because our approach here is hey man how much are we not doing for ourselves as family and friends for the people that are going through it? Mm -hmm. So the content itself is more, it's framed in the position of those that treat it, those that experience it, and those that deal with those that are experiencing what's going on Mm -hmm. and whose story is actually being told. So when it comes to those, like I want to have more people that deal with folks with manic episodes just to talk about you know, I thought I knew what a manic episode was. And then when I started living with my partner going through it or my friend going through it all the time, I realized, wow, I really was not giving good advice to those that were that I was telling about 
dealing with these manic episodes like oh I got it and I mm-hmm. actually did not have it Yeah. and here's why I didn't have it mm-hmm. and this is what we did to make a better environment for that person and then what is the hard cut off for I can't handle that anymore what does that being handled look like when you can no longer handle helping the person yeah. and those are real conversations that I don't think are happening often mm-hmm. or by the time they do happen it happens once the whole situation is said and done and yeah. everybody's now in their new place that's usually not together or with each other anymore. Yeah. I think as a society, we need to practice more empathy. Like, I don't feel like people try to understand. Like... I agree. You know, curiosity has mm-hmm. gone out the window. Just, like, genuinely wanting to understand why a person might be acting that way. You don't have to accept. Or be the solution. Or be the solution. Yeah. But I think it would help foster more more constructive conversations right mm-hmm. like you know trying to i don't know if i told you about a story about a um 12 year old boy that i saw was like fighting with the security guard and then nah, he ended nah, up getting nah, arrested now nah, we here now we here now three strike rules we here now <laughs> exactly <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah so i saw this um 12 year old i was w- walking out of work mm-hmm. and the 12 year old is fighting with the security guard Mm -hmm. not that he's punching the security guard but it's more like the security guard is trying to keep him from getting in the bank and so i just can't walk i'm walking to my car but i cannot just like pass this and not say anything so i asked security guards like this your son and he's like no no son of mine would ever talk to me like this um and then the boy like kind of walks away and so i follow him because like obviously he's a kid like he needs somebody to look out for him Mm -hmm. um but he's just like not talking he's just like leave me alone like he's just really agitated and so then police officers arrive and they start to try and like calm him down follow him whatever his mom comes out of the bank and I recognize her because I've seen her before at work and I recognize that he's probably been my patient I just didn't recognize him that day because he was asleep the entire time that I saw him in the office because he was over medicated um, but this boy is autistic and he has these like aggressive behavior outbursts and so it was really hard for him to get through school Um, and mom's like been looking for a psychiatrist for him um, but she's been unsuccessful so anyway i try to tell the police officers like hey he's autistic they're yelling at him like calm down calm down stop it you know like i'm like you can't yell at an first of all you shouldn't yell at an agitated person because that's going to make them more agitated secondly an autistic person is not going to respond to traditional like tactics or methods to like calm someone down. Long story short, they end up putting him in handcuffs and pinning him to the front of the police car. And I'm just like, this is making it worse. Like, can he like sit in the back of the police car? Obviously he needs to go to the hospital, like his mom. And I think this whole thing started because he tried to push his mom in the street when the bus was coming. So not that he was right, but he's also autistic and has this like background, right? So when you say autistic, what part of the autistic spectrum would you put him at while explaining that part of the spectrum and how things usually function, like folks who are on that part? Because, mm. you know, now autistic has become a broader word. Yeah. So it's important to explain that. So he's verbal. Mm-hmm. He understands language. Mm-hmm. It's just that he doesn't he's on the part of the spectrum where he doesn't understand like social cues his behavior is unmanageable like he's more rigid with change like Mm -hmm. those types of things what's an example of two social cues that the average person would have that he doesn't have that you think would play a part in this kind of situation Mm -hmm. so i've only seen this kid one time and like i said Mm -hmm. he was asleep yeah but an example for where i thought like based on his interaction that day in front of the bank Mm -hmm. i would say you know if someone's telling a joke he might not get the joke you know or if it's a sarcastic joke he might not get the the joke because he's so mm-hmm. literal blind or, to sarcasm right yeah um or like he's probably not gonna make good eye contact with you during a conversation mm-hmm. um those are like two two big things that go with autism okay yeah um so we're about to get back to raising risers but i think this is a really good moment Oh, wait, let me finish my story. Go. So um, he's in handcuffs. Mm -hmm. The sergeant arrives and he's a black guy. Mm -hmm. There was a black 
patrolman and a white patrolman. These are the two guys that arrested him. Yeah. Um, and so the sergeant comes and he's like, let's take, how can I help you? And the boy says, I just want these handcuffs off. They're hurting me. And so he takes the handcuffs off and the boy is like starting to calm down. And then the sergeant puts them in the back of the police car. It was really hot that day. And so he's in the air conditioner now and he's calming down. Like, you know, it's just the fact mm -hmm. that despite having a physician because i'm wearing my uniform it says mm -hmm. dr jones yeah i'm talking to these policemen like hey is there another way there's a better way we don't have to do this you're making him more agitated they cannot hear that he is just a child they are treating him as if he's violent and i think that bias permeates our society like you know that's why the police are more likely to shoot a black kid than a white kid, right? Mm -hmm. You know, like we have so many names that, you know, have suffered from the gun violence from police. But yeah. So anyway, the ambulance came and they took him away. But that now was now that's another bill. Well, he's, I don't know. He's no, got Medicaid. I don't know. No, no, I mean, no, no, like this Medicaid. Saying, I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm just saying. I hear ambulance and I'm like, dang, mom just came out the bank. She just came out the bank and she had three other kids. Mm hmm that were there witnessing yeah. it yeah so that's a lot right it's yeah. traumatic like and so how can you tell a, you know when he gets to be an adult or those those siblings become adults mm -hmm. they've witnessed so much trauma that they have to overcome mm -hmm. to be highly successful so how and can you just tell sometimes you have trauma association too right like you weren't good as a brother so why should i listen to you now mm -hmm. even if you've become a better version of who you were before yeah and so to tell these people, like, yeah, pull up by your bootstraps, just get it together. Mm -hmm. It's like, no, there's so much. And that's just that day. Mm -hmm. But that's not even acknowledging all the family traumas over the mm -hmm. last seven or eight generations. You know, like, I mean, it's you're, you're going to need more than just yourself to overcome that. Yeah. Yeah. Police training. Yeah. Do you think niggas just aren't trained? Like they're trained to be cops, but nothing else? Because even if you're taught empathy, right? People like you know what the better version of that looks like, but people like them that have the badge are there to enforce the law. But as you say and saw, they don't want to do the better version of what does doing this job even though I'm aggravated right now there's a professional that's trying to advise me look like yeah I don't I don't know if it's them just being cops because uh -huh. in the 60s and 70s mm -hmm. was was it that violent like interactions with the police were they that violent I know there's like a racial component but mm -hmm. outside of that if you I've heard that there were like cops that patrolled specific neighborhoods they were known to the neighborhood right yeah. and so you've seen a kid grow up from the time that they were like a baby until like this 12 year old you're not going to put that 12 year old in handcuffs because you know him you know his mom you know mm -hmm. his family like so this is kind of like hey what are you doing like yeah. you know just get it together you know you shouldn't be doing that as opposed to like going immediately to like we're putting you in handcuffs and we're going to take you to the stations like what why don't policemen see kids as kids mm -hmm. right it's like that has and nothing to do with kids yeah that has nothing to do with being a cop or like being trained to be a cop mm -hmm. the other thing is i think as a society we have gone more towards like quantity over quality tell me more so it's more important to have you're gonna get these comments off today Huh? I said, you're going to get these comments off today. I'm getting comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> it's more important to have people hired quickly than mm -hmm. to train them properly. Yeah. Right? Yeah, and so if it takes so. a year to make a good cop, well, we need to have 30 cops in the next three months. So we're just going to hurry up and... Coverage. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so now you have... And I don't, know, I don't know that you have to have a college education to be a cop. I'm not sure. We could look that up later and talk about yeah. that next episode. Yeah. Yeah, that would be like a tidbit thing that we follow up on. Yeah, but um, if you're if you're basically training high school graduates to interact in pretty specialized situations, like you're dealing with psychiatric patients, you have no training on how to deal with psychiatric patients, and so mm -hmm. somebody you know who's having a manic episode tries to lunge at you, you're gonna like 
push them down and put your knee on their neck like that's an overreaction how many times as a doctor have you seen that overreaction play out in the hospital i have not seen it play out in the hospital i feel like not enough was done in the hospital and not necessarily in terms of like force or aggression but it's just like like one time when i was in residency there was this girl who was transferred from PIW to, PIW is the Psychiatric Institute of Washington, I think, um, but it's a mental health institute for kids. And she was transferred from there a month before her 18th birthday. I can't remember exactly why she was transferred, but she had a history of PTSD because her brother had her when she was young, like six or seven or something. Got to say, as a unfortunately, YouTube say that. Um, will like block certain content, so you have to say. Oh, essay. Yeah. Okay. She experienced essay from her brother when um, she was like six or seven. Jesus. And so every night she's trying to leave because she doesn't want to be there, but she's a minor because she's a month from her 18th birthday, and so and. And in order to keep her there, they are restraining her with these Velcro-like restraints. Um, and she's having these PTSD episodes now because that's probably what her brother did to her. So she's being held down against her will and she's just screaming, let me out, let me out, let me out, let me out, like all night long. And so my suggestion was, um, why don't we just let her go? Like, she's going to be 18 next month. No, we can't do that because of liability. I think we talked about the L, L word, word before. Yeah. Um, okay. Why don't we give her something to help her sleep? Mm -hmm. Well, in pediatrics, we usually don't do stuff like that. It's like, well, she's almost an adult. Like, <laughs> And she's going yeah. through this nightly. Yeah, and we keep restraining her. Like, yeah, that's which is just... making it worse, you know? And what do you think things like that build up to like can p ptsd mm -hmm. can ptsd lead up to other things if you go through that nightly or that kind of treatment i don't know because i'm not a psychiatrist mm -hmm. but i suspect like if you hear people who are talking about their experiences at war mm -hmm. when they're having an episode here they don't recognize that that's what's going on yeah. and so i can imagine you can black out and do anything like mm -hmm. I, I mean it's it's super unpredictable what a person will do when yeah. they feel threatened or when they're re-experiencing a trauma so yeah yeah sheesh good god let's get back to raising risers raising risers <laughs> yeah <so. laughs> now nah, let's get back to bootstraps because that's where this all started <laughs> and notice bootstrap i'm gonna keep calling her bootstrap okay that's fine she's a reflection of her husband too Maybe that's why they're together. Yeah. I think, though, in the conversation, uh -huh. he became more open to the other perspective. Uh, how so? Um, just because my, my PR director was just more like, hey, you got to acknowledge, like, slavery is the root. Like, these are all the ways that slavery is the root. Like, mm -hmm. even if we go back to the 60s, even if we go back to the 20s, even if we go back to Reconstruction, like, things were always put in place to keep black people down. Mm -hmm. And every time black people figured out a way to get ahead, the government put in something else that would knock them down. Yeah. Was it Tulsa, Oklahoma, where the black people had that booming economic... Um, the market? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. And then they set it on fire, mm -hmm. you know? Okay, so we tried to get ahead, but then the government or, you know, mm -hmm. the oppressors came and knocked it down. Yeah. Crack was introduced specifically into the black neighborhoods right not i mean cocaine was over in the white neighborhoods i guess because it's expensive whatever but mm -hmm. crack was funneled from nicaragua to the inner cities yeah as a measure of making sure like we didn't get ahead that was yeah, the don't that go was, far now don't have any bright ideas right that was the yeah. most recent unless there was something else i can't think of but that was the most recent destruction of the black family it started in slavery times with the willie lynch theory where you know mm -hmm. they abused the the black woman in front of her husband until she or no they what was it they abused SA. the that's essay too that's essay yeah that's essay okay. moment too yeah uh did it in front of the husband to break him 
so there would be right. no unity in the families. Yeah. Yeah. And that still exists today, right? Mm -hmm. Like we don't, now black men don't even think it's a big deal that they're not a part of their families. It's kind yeah. of just like, oh, that's normal. That's mm -hmm. how my family was. That's how my grandmother's family was. So. Yeah. And it's yeah. like, no, nah, you can't accept that. Right. No. Yeah. There so. should be better unity. But you could also see how things like that are hereditary. I forgot who I was talking to that said that did, they did research. It was these research they did with mice, right? And what they did was they had a, um, what's the conditioning called? Like when you condition someone, it's like when you zap them or something like that to have a bad oh. association. Are you talking about the Pavlov? experiment i'm not sure but i know that uh, mice had kids and then when they got put in a box they never once right. tried to go yeah. towards the entrance and it's called epigenetics they, in, in general in scientific mm -hmm. terms it's called epigenetics where your dna is affected mm -hmm. by your experience yeah so yeah and all these things are hereditary whether mm -hmm. people want to acknowledge it or not yeah so yeah Bootstraps. Bootstraps. Raising risers. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but let's get back to raising, raising risers and all the magic that you brought to life <laughs> outside of this dark chapter we just had in this wow, discussion. Wow, we really went down that dark rabbit hole. Yeah, I was like, fast. look, if you want to go, I'll go with you. Yeah. I'm going to pull you back. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, yeah, bootstraps. Mm -hmm. um, she she brought she had an opinion. She brought an opinion that fostered real depth in conversation about the plight of Black people in this country, and helped me promote raising risers because that's exactly what I'm trying to do with the nonprofit is just like educate people on the ways that they are traumatized. Maybe bringing awareness to the ways that you are traumatized will help you change mm -hmm. your behavior if not your behavior your kid will be different because they are raised in a way that is not the trauma i'm really glad about the work that you did a couple of weeks ago mm -hmm. because body image yeah right body image is mm -hmm. really important and my platform doesn't really touch on that much because Unless folks bring it up, I ain't really being like, hey, man, how do you feel about body image yeah. today? Yeah. Because, you know, I call my folks bad bitches. All of my, my mm -hmm. friends, they all bad bitches. Men and yeah. women, they know what's up, right? And your image starts from such a young age. It does. You yeah. know, showering, putting on deodorant, getting a haircut, if hopefully someone could pay for the haircut. Mm -hmm. What encouraged you to want to put together such an an impactful and sincere event for the young ladies? I think um, there's a lot of focus on black boys, whether it's negative or positive, mm -hmm. right? And I feel like black girls are often overlooked or ignored. Yeah. And so this was a way for me to make them feel seen Black in the black community, hair is very important. It's mm -hmm. your, it's part of your identity. Mm -hmm. Even as an adult, you know, you express yourself through the things you do with your hair. One day it could be long to the ground. The next yeah. day it could be short. You can change the color. You can have it curly. You can have it straight. You know, and so I think that's a versatility that exists uniquely in the black community, mm -hmm. um, and that starts, like you said, from a very young age. So. I think a common experience that all black women and black girls have is like getting their hair done before school, whether it's the day, you know, the day, every day before school, or if it's like back to school, you got to get your hair done so you can take your pictures mm -hmm. before you get on the bus. Like that's a, that's a common experience. And so I just wanted to give people the opportunity to have a positive experience because a lot of times black girls and black women talk about it being negative like oh I hated getting my hair done my mom always hated doing my hair and so if you have people who enjoy doing hair making the girls feel beautiful then the mom is happy the daughter's happy yeah. everybody's happy and it's, it's a more positive experience so that was the inspiration behind the event I also like doing hair I actually went to hair school you have a salon in your house <laughs> I have a salon in my house. A whole room. That's I have a room dedicated to mm -hmm. beauty, yes. That that has yeah. all the instruments and the equipment that's needed. Well, right? except for a shampoo bowl. So that's but, coming soon. Uh, 
Maybe. I'm good with my oh. kitchen sink, which is another common experience oh, yeah. amongst black girls and women. Yeah. Like, everybody got their hair washed. Kitchen sinks at with least. fish bones. Yeah. Yeah, that took me out of the game. <laughs> Literally. Just you said you had enough. That. I yeah, mean, how many back. fish bones have the girls seen in the sink when they're getting their hair washed like that? All right. That wouldn't have turned us off. <laughs> Yo, in my Jamaican home, there wouldn't have been a fishbone in that sink. I didn't tell you that. Shoot, in this home, there ain't no fishbone in the sink either. I couldn't do that. That was it for me. I was like, oh, nah, I got to cut my hair now. That's it. Yeah. Imagine yeah. laying on the counter with your head in the sink as if it's a bowl. Like, that's a yeah. lot of, that's an experience that a lot of black girls yeah. and women have I've had. I've always seen so. that been like, see, that looks adorable and annoying, but adorable. It's uncomfortable. Yeah. It really is. So yeah. I think... The the time the last time I remember doing that uh-huh. I was probably fourteen. Yeah, is that like a rite of passage laying down on a kitchen counter and getting? I don't think it's a drink? rite of passage. No, uh, I, no. I'm just saying, like you know, you said it was annoying, but your face said, "I, I it's a memory." <laughs> I just said that one because I was mm-hmm. way too big to be laying on the, <laughs> on the counter getting my hair washed. just had me bent over in the counter at this point. We couldn't find a stool or something. Like, come on, yo. <laughs> come on, yo. <laughs> Did you yeah. have patience as a kid? Patience? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. I'm the oldest. Um, my being brother. old doesn't mean you're going to be the most mature. Oh, okay. Well, I only know my experience, but uh, my brother is two years younger than me. And the Mm -hmm. story goes like he's I'm I'm a Pisces. We talked about Pisces before Mm -hmm. and I'm very chill until I'm not chill. Mm -hmm. But usually it takes a lot. Yeah. As a two year old, I'm here with my brother, who's a Gemini, and we're sharing a room. Keep going. <laughs> and so I had my little toddler bed and I guess he had his crib and he would wake up in the morning and just like scream and cry and cry and cry. And my parents said that I would just like lay there and pretend that I was still sleeping. <laughs> He'll stop. He'll stop eventually. This is not my response. Well, yeah. When you say that I have patience, it's like, mm-hmm. yeah, I definitely. Yeah. Yeah, your environment dictates you have to have patience to survive. <laughs> like, I enjoy this piece. I'm going to protect my piece. I'm going to lay right here. There's nothing I can do about it. I just got to wait, wait yeah. it out. Yeah. Yeah, so. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What was the effect of that event? What was the goal? And then what was the effect? Let's talk about the goal of the event that you put together. The goal was to make black girls feel seen mm-hmm. and to empower them, even down to the playlist. I had a playlist for the event and okay. all the all the songs were about like acknowledging your beauty, being confident, uh, loving yourself, being loved by others, um, what that looks like. So that was the goal. You said, what was the effect? Mm-hmm. The effect was that I accomplished my goal and then the women who particip- like who volunteered also got something from it, which I was not expecting. What did they get from it? I think the conversation that they had was, um, I don't know what another way to put it. It just made them feel seen. I, I don't know that they get an opportunity to share their experience like that. Mm-hmm. I think in the black community, motherhood is supposed to be um, about sacrifice. And if you complain or not even complain or, you know, just call out the hard, I mean, the challenges, you're looked at as a bad mom. Like, oh, I you're can't not grateful you. right. for your opportunity to be a mom. It's or like, like oh, you had hard. kids, so this is what you're supposed to do. But it's yeah. like, no, I'm still a person. And I don't think the person is acknowledged in Enough. black motherhood, you yeah. know. And so, um, yeah, one of the stylists actually found out that she was pregnant like a week or two before the event mm-hmm. <laughs> she had already agreed to do it like yeah. a month ago and so even that i think her experiencing like the morning sickness and like trying to stand up and like push through the event because she already made the commitment it's like no like mm-hmm. you know if you're not feeling good because you're pregnant then just say that you know that's like a reasonable excuse not to yeah not to continue but she said that her body kind of like got it together and she was able to (laughs) 
she was able to make it through the event and she was thankful that she was able to to stay for the entire event because she she really got something from the conversation um, she said I needed this that was like her her those were exact words at the end of the event why do you want to do this event I mean, I know, like, it's dope as fuck. Don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. You feel what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But it's like, I've never heard someone say, hey, this kind of event you did would be cool, and I'm going to do it. And then two weeks later, it's like, all right, man, yeah. I got it coming up. I got yeah. my camera guy. Yeah. I got, we got everything we need. Shoot. We yeah. folks doing nails, right? Yeah, that was the last minute. That was a Hail Mary. Okay, tell one me of about the that students, Hail Mary. One of the, so my, um, the director of programming for Raising Risers, mm -hmm. I met her in hair school. I'm going to meet her soon. You will meet her soon. Yeah. Um, and so she was at the school one day just like talking about the event and mm -hmm. the nail instructor said, hey, we would like to participate. We'll have our students come and do nails. And I was like, bet, let's do it. Um, and so the one student came and she did nails for like two or three hours which is a, an additional bonus right like that was not something that I planned for or expected one for two yeah. to three hours how many hands did she get out of the way if you took a guess how many how I think every was the event and how many people would you say you guys ended up serving at the end the event started at 8 a.m. Mm -hmm. and we took the last client at 2 p.m. Mm -hmm. and the most people were there between 8 and like 10 so at 7.30, people were like, hey, is this the event? Like, they really wanted to get in. and Because it was a first-come, first-serve event. Mm -hmm. um, and so I guess they really wanted to get make sure they got their hair done. Um, we served probably 12, 12 girls total. Mm -hmm. um, I think... So two of the girls came at, like, 1, 1.30. Yeah. And so the nail per student had already left at that time. But all the other girls got their nails done before before they left like they were waiting in line to get their nails done because it's like oh i got my hair done i need to get my nails done too so how many people did you guys end up serving all together 12 for the nails or just for everything for everything yeah for the nails maybe like 10. you know what you need to start doing what? you need to start having a count of people served so far by raising risers yes i've heard that before yeah, yeah. like like mm -hmm. you know how um it's either mcdonald's or another company that says a million burgers served. Served. Yeah, yeah yeah that's how you, that's how you gotta do because yeah. i'm hearing this and it's like you know technically the numbers are double when you go hair versus hands yeah, that's yeah. true. Mm -hmm. Se separate topics. Yeah. <laughs> so and I so think technically 24? 24. 24. Yeah. Yeah, 24 services administered. Mm -hmm. But um, I think that's another thing. Like, women are allowed to get their nails done. Mm -hmm. But I don't think black girls, like in some households, black girls are told, like, no, you're you're too young to get your nails done. That's so grown. But it's like, Is I'm it doing. associated with promiscuousness or something like that? I don't know the reasoning behind it. Okay. I never had the desire as a kid to have my fingernails done. My mm -hmm. mom let me get my my toenails painted. Yeah. That wasn't ever made into a, like a big thing, so I don't know where that stems from. But mm -hmm. um, I feel like the girls are are imitating what they see their moms doing. It's like, mm -hmm. oh, mom, I'm going with you every other week to go get your nails done. How come I can't get my nails done? Like, what's wrong with that? Yeah. And so you know, even for the the moms who were there to allow their kids to get their nails done, I thought was big too. I see us having round table discussions with women about this and me just standing on the other side of the camera having you lead discussions and be like mm -hmm. you go Jory you, you go girl that's the right question killing them <laughs> um, but yeah you asked me why, what made me want to do the event on the mm -hmm. radio you hear Craig Black talking about cuts for kids cuts for kids back to school cuts for kids mm -hmm. cuts for kids to me says haircuts I didn't know at the time when I got the idea to do the event, like, oh, they actually do girls hair too. But it's marketed as like haircuts for kids. And so I was like, again, black boys are always the focus, whether it's positive or negative. What about the black girls? They probably need it more than the black boys because they have more hair, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I was like, well, we need to do something for the, for the girls. Let's do it at my former hair school. And that was a, that was a blessing too. It's like, you know, I, I didn't finish cosmetology school. Mm -hmm. 
And to some at the time, it might have seemed like a waste, like, oh, wow, you spent six months going to hair school after work and then you just didn't even finish. But the relationships that I built during that time led to this moment. So, I mean, it wasn't it wasn't a waste at all. I'm, I'm not of the mindset that anything is ever enough. I think there needs to be more of a lot of stuff. But I mean, I get mm-hmm. that there's limited resources in people's time, especially when they're donating the time. Yeah. Are there more events for young black girls? Mm-hmm. Or just young girls in general that you hear of when it comes to wellness stuff or just like what you put together? Oh, things that I hear, no. I don't hear many events about black girls, actually. What are what are ideas that you think someone like yourself or others or organizations that are out there should put together that you think would be helpful? Because what you're attacking right now is the environment around children and how important that is outside of just body image, presentation. Mm-hmm. How do you feel mm-hmm. someone being willing to donate time and to give you an opportunity to be as dope as you hope you can one day be as a kid? Yeah. So, I'm hitting you with the heavy hitter questions, but I'm just like, nah, these are things I've been thinking about in my yeah, free time. Yeah, I mean, I think it starts with conversations amongst the adults. Like, and the and the children need to be, be present for the, for the conversations. Mm-hmm. Um, but I recently watched this documentary on Netflix called Daughters, and... You be watching your documentaries. I like documentaries, because I like to learn mm-hmm. about other people's perspectives. Yeah. It helps me relate to the community more. It's like, these are real people are doing... Like, I'm going to I'm gonna encounter you at the grocery store, mm-hmm. so I might as well understand, like, where you're coming from. Yeah. Um, but this documentary was about black girls in D.C., and they were preparing to go to a daddy-daughter dance with their incarcerated fathers. Right? And so just thinking about the fact that they have not seen their dads in however many years and they are preparing to go to a prison for a dance yeah first of all do they dance in prison is that allowed like (laughs) are they allowed to have music i mean i don't know i've seen videos lately on tiktok of of prisoners dancing dancing in prison prison. yeah is that a challenge i don't don't know i just know there's this one kind there's this (laughs) one page i came across and i was like that boy in prison. Mm. That boy dancing in prison. That boy getting views from dancing in prison. There's so many questions. Yeah, two, two of us. But mm-hmm. anyway, so. <laughs> <laughs> so the organization that's like sponsoring this dance at mm-hmm. the prison is girls for change yeah girls for a change um girls for a change yes and she's based in richmond and mm-hmm. she's basically doing what i'm trying to do like what make black doing? girls make black girls feel seen uh-huh. uh fill in the gaps to to promote cultural healing so like you know you don't have to be a team mother this is how love is supposed to feel and look Mm-hmm. You are beautiful. You are worthy. Like yeah. you are enough. Like that type of stuff. Mentorship for girls. Um, and so, after the documentary came out, they put out this campaign to host watch parties. Mm-hmm. And that's what I want. That's what I want my next event to be is like hosting a watch party for the community of this documentary, mm-hmm. and then having a conversation about, you know, yes, the fathers are absent because they are incarcer- incarcerated. But what about the fathers that are just absent? It all has the same impact on the black girl and how they view relationships with men and what they come to expect from others like later on and so yeah do you have dates in mind for your next event or right now look there's one thing at a time and just putting things together so i'm thinking that the last or second to last saturday in october Mm -hmm. i have to secure a venue yeah but i'm thinking the end of october will be a good time because after that, we're going to start our um, Raising Risers mentorship program for black girls. Okay. And the target age group is going to be five to nine year olds. Well, five to 12 year olds, mm-hmm. but we're gonna recruit five to nine year olds so that we can follow them for at least three years um, from when they start the program. And so that's gonna be a weekly thing. Like we'll meet with them, we'll teach them life skills, we'll teach them about self-respect, um, 
and then we'll take field trips once a month and kind of just like expose them to things that they might not otherwise see. Um, so this now brings the conversation about the man donation. Yeah. How do you handle that? Like, what's the purpose behind the van? Like, do you have to hire someone to drive the van? Like, what's the the thinking when someone says, hey, man, I got a van. You want a van? I got a van. Yeah. You should take this van. So, unfortunately, the, the van's brakes don't work. And so, it doesn't make it useful in that way. But getting the money for the van is going to go a long way. Okay. Yeah. All right. So... <laughs> 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 I was like, excuse me? <laughs> Bootstraps gave you a van where the brakes don't work? <laughs> it's because she got a new van. So that's why they're getting rid of their own van, because the brakes don't work. So instead of them selling it, they're giving you the title to mm -hmm. sell the van. Mm -hmm. So the money would technically be donated to the organization. Right. Wouldn't it have been easier if they just sold the van and just donated the money directly, or is there complications with stuff like that? Well, that takes more work on their part, mm -hmm. right? Like, they, they can just give away the van, and then we mm -hmm. can choose to fix it up yeah. or sell it or whatever. Yeah. But we're still in the early um, stages of our financial earnings period, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't have the money to fix a van, mm -hmm. you know? So I'd rather smart decision. I'd rather get the money from the van, yeah. and then maybe use that to host events where I can get donations from people. Smart um, decision. Yeah. Have you thought about exploring reaching out to the D.C. government for their resources, or is there a lot going on and a lack thereof currently? Yeah. So I do have a grant writer. Mm -hmm. I am. I'm working with her to find the right grants for this organization. I am skeptical about just blindly going for funds from the government, DC mm -hmm. government or federal, just because I feel like, and this is from my experience as a recipient of a federal loan, like once you accept money from the government, you are putting on handcuffs and I don't want to lose. Where they basically dictate what you do right. with the money. And I don't want to lose the vision within these like arbitrary boundaries mm -hmm. that the government might put on me. So. I think about stuff like that. That's actually one of the reasons that I was like, I don't want to become a 501 a lot of numbers and letters to keep straight. <laughs> I'd rather just get it done and keep it pushing. Mm -hmm. But do you think that there's a lot of scrutiny with the process and expectation of having a 501-3C? Um, I have not experienced it. Mm -hmm. I don't know any other nonprofit founders. Mm -hmm. So I haven't, I, I don't know if there's like scrutiny or mm -hmm. what people are saying. Yeah. I've just heard about like, hey, they go through your taxes. They go through like, hey, what do you have going on? What properties do you own? Are you working multiple jobs? Do those jobs conflict with, will conflict with what you have going on when it comes to your nonprofit? What's the purpose of your nonprofit? I always think that's to be expected because it's like mm -hmm. if you start a business or a nonprofit, which is a business, what are you doing with said things? And are you actually keeping to not just the letter of the law for what you claim to be doing, but are you at least putting the business or the process or the campaign in position to get things done? Mm -hmm. And are you trustworthy? You're saying these are the questions the government is asking? No, just what I've heard from like other folks who like run nonprofits or have worked at the bigger nonprofits. Yeah, I think I think that comes from like we were talking about earlier, people wanting something for nothing, mm -hmm. and so you can because it's a you don't get taxed by having this five hundred one three C classification. People can take advantage of that, you know, and funnel their money through it and you know use it for other things and so I, I do think it's important to like have the checks and balances where you need to prove that you're doing what you're saying that you're doing mm -hmm. um, and so I don't I don't find that part cumbersome if you're honest like yeah. Yeah. you know it shouldn't be a big deal yeah yeah but I did hire an accountant just so I can make sure I have my paperwork <laughs> <You're> like, <laughs> <you're not gonna laughs> <catch me> <laughs> 
<laughs> no me. <laughs> yeah. And so that's where, like, you know, in our last interview, you were asking me, like, how much have you spent on it? It's like, that's where the costs come up. It's like mm-hmm. trying to make sure that the business is handled appropriately. And that is expensive. It's like, you know, mm-hmm. I've hired an accountant. I've hired a, tra- a trademark lawyer. I've hired... A grant writer. These costs yeah. add up. Yeah, they do. And this is before you even figure out how much you're going to be able to get paid off of a nonprofit that you've been running. Right. Yeah. In order for your business to be successful, if you don't mind, um, actually, that's a good question. What does mm-hmm. success look like for your nonprofit financially? Uh, success looks like it's sustainable without my income. Mm-hmm. My like you know, and even if. This is not my goal from mm-hmm. the nonprofit, but yeah. even if I could pay myself a salary and it's still sustainable, that is the ultimate success financially. But I think if I never make a dollar from it, if I am impacting the people in the way that I want to impact them, that mm-hmm. is the most important to me. Like if in 50 years I see the next generation who is like not just taking a step forward, but taking maybe 20 steps forward, you know, that would. I mean, that would make all of this worth it, even if I went bankrupt personally, like, Mm -hmm. you know. Don't go bankrupt. No, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. I'll be like, hey, 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 Jonesy, we need to have a talk. (laughs) Let's go sit at that nice kitchen table and have a little chat about what's going on right at the booth. Yeah. (laughs) Okay. But I have a financial planner who's um, helping me personally manage my finances. Her name is Mm -hmm. Ariana Snow. Ariana Stowe. Mm Mm-hmm. S T O W E. Mm-hmm. Um, Stout. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but her goal is to like um, ensure that Black women are generating generational wealth, mm-hmm. right? And so she's she's really helped me a lot. Yeah. What was it like having Brooke record the um, Machina Media record the event? and be in that space. Was that anything that you uh, considered going into that, having an all-woman space with a guy who's recording and putting this stuff together? No, I didn't think about that at all. But you it know, didn't if affect you, the space negatively. No, it was, I mean, I don't even know that they, not to say that they were rude and they did not acknowledge him, but it was as if like, it was like okay, he's over there doing. <laughs> he's doing the same guy. <laughs> Camera guy, on camera, yeah. <laughs> he did interview the the um, women because when Brooke got there, mm-hmm. it was almost over. He got there probably like twelve, yeah. Which we just didn't time it right. Like mm-hmm. I didn't know that it's we were going to be rushing the door at eight o'clock. So it's your first time, yeah. yeah. Well, not eight o'clock. They rushed your door at seven thirty. Yeah. Yeah. Mid set up on a Saturday. Yeah, a Sunday. Yeah. Sunday. Oh my bad. Yeah. On a Sunday. Yeah. yeah. So mm-hmm. I think it was good that he was able to um, interview the people, the women that were there when it wasn't as busy and mm-hmm. hectic. Mm-hmm. I think that was that was a good benefit of him coming at 12. Mm-hmm. Um, and then he also got to hear the conversation amongst the women, yeah. which I think is important for black men. I'm not even sure if Brooke is, is he black? Oh, he black. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's too. important for black men to mm-hmm. understand the black woman's perspective because there's a lot of misunderstanding and miscommunication between the sexes. Like, mm-hmm. you know, this perception that black women are angry and bitter. It's like, no, I'm misunderstood or I'm not seen or, I'm, yeah. you know, when I, when I see the black woman in the establishment who is going off and getting loud, mm-hmm. It's because, I think it's because she is fed up and nobody has listened to her the 10 times that she has said it nicely. Yeah. And so that's the reaction that you get. You're going to see me. I usually think if someone is angry and bitter, what's the source of that? Mm -hmm. And the other thing I keep in mind is, well, as long as it's not angry and bitter at me, I'm usually understanding of, oh, that person over there that's angry and bitter? They won't be angry and bitter towards me, so obviously I'm getting something right. Now, yeah. source-wise, if they want to let me know what's up, they eventually let me know what's up. Yeah. But if they don't, I'm just glad they're doing well until otherwise. So you say you're you're not okay if they're angry and bitter at you? No. Oh. I get if they're angry and bitter at me, but what I tend to find is when I bump into people who are angry and bitter, there's usually a source behind it, like right. what you said. Mm-hmm. And 
I, I, ch- I try not to ask unless it's time to ask. Like, mm. if I just met you, you don't owe me an explanation. If we're working together every Monday and Friday mm-hmm. and we're around each other for hours yeah. and you have nothing but angry and bitter, I'm going to have to ask, hey, what's up with you? Yeah. And if you want to talk, cool. And if not, all right, well, still got a job to do. Is, is you not asking about it on the first encounter because you don't have the capacity to deal with whatever the response is? Or is it no, because... No, they don't know me. I think it's really important that when you ask, there has to be a relationship or an understanding of we see each other on the regular or around each other's stuff. I like to challenge that. I hear you. Because... You could be the one person that mm-hmm. asked, you know, that could change the, you know, that could change how her day is going. I also mm-hmm. deal with a lot more people than you do on the daily. Well, no, as a doctor. Well, no, actually, <laughs> no. Nah. How many people do you see on a day? We're counting the kids and their parents. I'm, I'm counting everybody. Okay. If we, if we count every person that I see, let's see, I see 20, 20 patients in a day. If we multiply that, let's say they at least have a sibling and a parent with them. Mm-hmm. So that's times, that's 60 people a day. I deal with, when going to work for the current job I'm working, I usually deal with about 800 to 14 a day, 1,400 people a day. Mm-hmm. And usually 40 to 50 of those people make it a point to come back to want to have a chat with me about something. Okay. And when there's a situation, like I'm really, I'm probably one of the best people at diffusing a situation and turning whatever the problem is into a conversation instead of a, well, why they treat me like that? Yeah. And it's like, well, here's the policies, here's the liability thing. The story you told me, they have to remove you from right. the place because you're not following the rules. But outside of that, I usually tell people and I preface it like this, we're technically here to protect the good time. Yeah. So then I would say uh you're seeing a thousand people or more a day. Uh You don't have the capacity to engage and ask that There's less patience. Yeah. But for the people that do want to talk, I have pulled people to the side and be like, hey man, what's, I'm at work. I let them know I'm at work. But what's going on with you? Mm -hmm. Especially if if it's someone I know, it's I know you're not usually like that. If it's not somebody I know, you do tend to have to be a little bit more careful because, and understandably so, people usually think that if you talk to them, there's something you're trying to get out of them, like from them. And it's like, Mm -hmm. no, I'm just trying to see, like you came out, it's Saturday, Sunday, or Friday. You're obviously not having a good time. I have no issue with talking to a stranger about being a stranger, what's going on in their life. But then it's it's kind of uncomfortable for me, though, when it now becomes a dependency and expectation. And it's like, no, I'm still at work. Mm -hmm. I can help you when I help you. But every time I see you, I can't always be the help. And it's not fair that I'm at work and I have to help you at work. Yeah, because that's not in your job description. But for a person like me, it's mm-hmm. like, that's actually my job. It is. It is. <laughs> yeah. And also the, the clientele that we're handling is different. Mm-hmm. I'm handling a clientele that's running around from their problems or learning to blow off steam. And everyone blows off steam differently. Mm-hmm. And you technically don't get to dictate how people blow off steam until it becomes destructive. Yeah. 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 So... Yeah, we're but just the quality of conversation you have is wild because it's I, a part of the frame. I um, I feel like mm-hmm. the quality is better than the quality you have. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But Changing in terms of like else, actually yeah. getting to what the issue is, mm-hmm. I don't think I have enough time to do that. Like, you're supposed to see a, a patient in twenty minutes, mm-hmm. right? And this is assuming that I'm going to go home at the time that I'm supposed to go home. Yeah. Right. And so if the triage process takes up 15 of those minutes, technically I have five minutes. Mm -hmm. Right. But it usually goes on longer. I actually give the person the 20 minutes and then I end up staying like 30 or 40 minutes after work to finish up. But um, you can't address all of the family problems. If somebody says to you, like, my child is behaving differently. And then after a series of questions, because people are not great communicators, after a series of questions, I get Mm -hmm. down to the fact that the godfather was murdered in front of their home. 
last summer mm -hmm. and they still live at that home. I've used up my 20 minutes. Like, I, I cannot. <laughs> you also can't expect people to just up and move because there's and, mortgages and everything else. Yeah. So. Or rent or, like, you know, yeah. housing is scarce. So, yeah. like, I've just scratched the surface of the conversation. I have not really... I've identified the problem, but I don't think I've helped them solve the problem. I can and refer probably, you to a specialist. It's probably unprofessional, though, if you do follow up on that conversation. It's not unprofessional. That's probably what they uh -huh. expect and want. Yeah. But it comes down to capacity. If I did, if I see 60 people a day, that means I see, because I work four days a week, that means I see 240 people a week. Mm -hmm. How many hours and, a week are you working? Uh, it's 40. Yeah. Full 40 or 40? 40 because okay. like I work more than that because I'm staying over, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. 40 minutes if I just go over one patient, yeah. you know, like if I do that throughout the day, then it goes up mm -hmm. an hour, two hours, like, you know, so. Hope you're taking care of yourself. Yes, yes. That's why my day off is important. Mm -hmm. um, but what was I saying? Uh, 120 people. Oh, if I see 240 people in a week, mm -hmm. I cannot call every single person back and say like, hey, how's that conversation that we had? Or like, you know, how are things going? Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, I would say probably like, 90 percent 80 to 90% of the people that I encounter have something that is worth following up on yeah it's amazing to me and it feels too easy like last week I had a day where everybody was good like oh your weight's normal you're doing well in school you guys got the money you need all right that visit was actually like <laughs> you know the 20 minutes was satisfied I was like okay yeah. we don't have anything else to talk about but that's a rare occurrence mm -hmm. um and so I just for my own mental health I cannot engage with people outside of the scheduled structure of like appointments and yeah. that's our boundaries yeah yeah do you do you ever feel guilty for that I do because there are people that I work with that don't have the same boundaries mm -hmm. and so it makes me look like the the weird one or like oh wow you're just mean or mm -hmm. you just say no and you're just like do you ever have to defend yourself like hey man isn't I mean or actually care enough about myself to not leave this job to go cry in my car because I couldn't help somebody because we all have our limits um, I don't put it like that, mm -hmm. but I do defend myself quite often. I do yeah. feel the urge. Was that too mean? Was I scathing on that one? Was no, that too hard? I usually because... don't. In my professional life, mm -hmm. I am less vulnerable. Okay. And so I usually, unless I trust the person or like feel like we have a connection outside of work, I usually don't go that far. I'm more like systematically, this is why it doesn't work. So you allow this patient to come in 40 minutes late and now they have all these problems that I have to deal with and now I'm not getting to eat lunch. Mm -hmm. This is why it doesn't work. Or like, you know, um, these people have these jobs to do the thing that you're asking me to do. I cannot do my job in theirs. Like, yeah. you know, so yeah. it comes across more like that. But you usually at least recommend them to the other people who have those jobs that they can talk to about that, right? So we're talking about things like uh just like things that you notice and it's like i well i can't handle that because i have these 20 minutes but let me tell them follow up with this person after this well yeah yeah i can refer on. you to a specialist so yeah. you're doing a good yeah. job you're, I'm, I'm just trying to get to the good job i'm like all right because it's like yeah you're not you you have and i think it's very important for people to be careful of what kind of empathy are you exercising because mm -hmm. there's there's an overabundance of empathy where it's like hey man just want to let you know, I saw you last week selling your arm and your leg to get it done. Mm -hmm. Gonna have to chill out. <laughs> <laughs> You're gonna have to calm it down a little bit, right? Because like, there's there's always gonna be someone in your life or outside of your life with a problem, but you're not always gonna be able to help every single person. Mm -hmm. But the ones that you're helping, are you helping them as much as you can? I am, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. and that's that's what I usually question because yeah. it's like, you know, this what we do is volunteer work. This is all volunteer right. raising risers, mm -hmm. get home safe, mm -hmm. the podcast, bringing mm -hmm. people on, sourcing people, trying to figure out what events can we be a part of to really not just change and add to the narrative, but to help the common folks are the people we care about the people we don't know we care about yet mm -hmm. but like after that like um 
I've had four conversations this week and two of these very notable conversations with people that I either plan on doing work with or who I've worked with in the past. I'm hearing about folks that like, oh, 30K in rent. Mm. You feel what I'm saying? I'm hearing about folks that like are chasing the community and helping the community. And I have this very strong rule that I learned from when I did pro tryouts your dream should never come at the sacrifice of yourself Mm -hmm. or the people around you. So once you're no longer able to pay your bills or you're no longer able to stand on your own two feet or people are cutting you short of what you're owed, you may need to change pace and build something later that helps the community because none of what we do should ever come at a 10 pounds of flesh every single time I decide to help someone. Right, I, I, yeah. There's only so much I'm willing to eat and I'm not always going to want to put that weight back on. Mm-hmm. So like folks that I do work with or people that I sit down with or people who I'm aware of that I'm in contact with, I'm always wondering like, hey man, you, I, I say this all the time, don't bleed everywhere. Right. Like pick and choose what days you bleed and then certain days it's like, I ran out of band-aids. I don't know what to tell you guys. It's been great though. And like, you know, just take a break. That's why yeah. it's important. Like you, when you tell me about your couple days you had off, I said, shout out to you. Mm-hmm. Cause last week that was not the conversation. <laughs> last week was, man, I should have taken this day yeah, off. I yeah. And I was like, yeah, now nah, you right. If you saying it, then I'm like, yeah. Cause mm-hmm. like you already work hard enough. And like, you know, contrary to belief, it's never going to feel good enough, but it is good enough. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, one day you'll start yeah. to catch up to that, hopefully. Yeah. Not just you, other people too, but it's just right. like, you know, in general. That We, we kind of all suffer from the, oh, can I do more? My G, did you look at what you did? Yeah. Did you really look at what you did? I have a lot of questions for you about this event that you did for the young girls because, like, to me it's sensational. You know what I'm saying? But then after... No, no, that's my thing. You know know that's my jam. You know that's my jam, right? But then after that, I'm like, I well, why aren't there other people that are doing this? Or are there other people that are doing something similar to what I'm doing that I could work with or send people to that's not us after? Mm -hmm. Because, like, I'm not the... I can't be the end-all be-all. Ain't no no way I'm the end-all be-all. Yeah. So, I mean... Maybe I'm not locked in in a way where I'm aware of the other people that are doing <clears throat> the same thing I'm doing, but I use my event also to create opportunities for other people, right? Yeah. So, like, we had... Uh, Keep talking, I'm about to get some Gatorade. Okay. Some we had right um, Mending Wounds. I had them back. So she's a public health specialist who... Got my Gatorade. Thanks for letting me know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> She's a public health um, specialist who has developed these tools and resources and workshops for black women healing with tra- healing from trauma. And it's partially based on her own experience as a PTSD victim or a survivor, I should say. Um, she just found that the medical system in the U.S. did not support her in the way that she needed to, to be supported. And so she develop mending wounds as a you know a a way to fill the gaps and so I had her at the event because I figured the mothers that were sitting there waiting for their daughters to be done and also the girls probably I thought she could probably have good conversations with them and just check in and see like you know what are your needs emotionally and kind of fill those gaps and give out her card and build her business and build her brand and let people know about it so that's another unexpected uh, result of the event that I threw last last week or two weekends ago. We're not um, keeping count. You did it. That's yeah, what matters. That's what matters. Yeah, that's what matters. The other thing is I had uh, one of my patients, she actually came to braid because um, she told me that she wanted to I be remember. in hair school, yeah, right? And so yeah. like, okay, we're doing an event at a hair school. This is a perfect opportunity for you to come and introduce yourself to the person that is in charge of the hair school. Like, mm-hmm. you know, so... I felt really good about that too. It's like, that's one way that my full-time job kind of like, let me think of how to rephrase this. How, what I do at work translated into real help. You know, like if I feel like the 20 minutes is not enough, that was one example of how it like translated into a actual impact that I could see. 
because there's no continuity in my well there uh, let me not say there's no continuity but there is limited continuity yeah in my job so i'm proud of you thanks you're welcome i just it's good to hear that yeah just you need to hear that more <laughs> I'll be I wanting do. to hit your folks up like, hey, did you let her know you're proud of her today? <laughs> <laughs> Just start does, sending them an email. My mom does a good job of letting me know that she's proud of me, but it's mm-hmm. my mom. <laughs> I mean. <You> know? <laughs> <laughs> Take it while you so got it's it. Good. So it's good to <laughs> have it from other people, you know, yeah. like, yeah, yeah, that means like, it, not to say that my mom doesn't mean it because she's a straight shooter, but like, <laughs> it, <laughs> It provides more validity mm-hmm. and affirmation that I'm doing the right thing. You yeah. Know? Yeah. I mean, that's why that's why you're the host today. Thank you. I just, I'm going to get better at not cutting you off more and just letting you rant and be like, oh, let's see where this rant goes. That's scary. What, your rants? If you just let it go. What, the rants? Because then I forget about why I started saying what I said. No, nah, I bring it back. I'll be like, that's what we were talking about. Okay, that's my perfect. job to like always keep track. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, that's, that's how I get back to Razor Rogers. <laughs> Bootstraps. <laughs> yeah. Can I say that I'm really proud of you, too? Like, oh, just, thank you. Um, come, you're not even coming really from a mental health background, but the platform that you've established mm-hmm. based on your own personal experience, like, I think that's incredible. Oh, thank yeah. you. I, I appreciate that. I don't I don't often think about that. So it's nice to hear that. I, a lot of people have told me that they're proud of me. Mm-hmm. I think I'm very, hey, if you water it, grass is going to grow there. Mm-hmm. Right. But I'm not of the, hey, did you cut your grass today mindset? That makes sense? No. The reason you cut your grass is to make sure there's no weeds or everything and you don't Uh have other things that are growing in a bush. Mm -hmm. So I don't really, I'm not really aware of what the cause and effect of the actions that I'm taking are. Mm -hmm. I just know that for now they're making a difference past what now was yesterday. People are now reaching out to me with testimonies of getting help, getting therapy, saying that the content has helped them and being proud of something that I didn't know I was going to be proud of. Mm. I think, uh, and I don't know whether this is a good or a bad thing. I've, I didn't build this to one day have something I could be proud of. I built this because my partner at the time always wanted this and never was able to find the right fit. And I remember thinking to myself, if she was alive and we still had an opportunity to do this over, what would it have looked like if we actually had the right people around us and we had the education to properly get help for the people that we actually care about? Mm -hmm. And is it a good or a bad thing? Because, like, there's a big sacrifice on the time side. There's a big sacrifice on the focus side. Like, you know, when I'm not doing this, I try not to think about it. Mm. But, like, a lot of people hit me up, and it's like, even if you're trying not to think about it, people see you as a mental health person. Yeah. yeah. So, but I also have made it a point to learn. And even in conversations like, well, what you're talking about, there was a lot of things you said, and I was like, I don't think I have anything to add to that. Mm. So I may need to learn that, but then it's like, hey, how much time do you have to learn? Right, yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. you got to be careful. You're not trying to be the person who is educating you on things. You're trying to learn from them and realize, I right, how much do I need to add that to my perspective versus it's just okay to learn new things from people around you and be glad that they're in your life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Surrounding yourself with good people. Yeah. It goes a long way. Yeah. yeah. And you guys are awesome. Yeah. All right. So with that being said, um, do you have anything else coming up in the next couple of months? Or right now, are you taking your time as you put things together? And don't put a permanent date on anything. The reason I say that is what we think is going to happen versus mm-hmm. what actually happens. Right. Sometimes they're two different things. So Yeah. And people need to give each other grace on that. Right? Yeah. Like, Um, But I'm working on the watch party for daughters. That's going to be my next event at the end of October. Are you working with anybody on that yet? Um, My board. Good board. (laughs) I looked at the the names on the board. I'm a a part of the board. I'm I'm in the board now, too. (laughs) (laughs) I looked at the names on the board and I was like, wow, these people look like they're going to be dope. Yeah. 
It's a very <laughs> magical group of people. Are they all self-driven? Yes. Like they have something that's going on that you're like, oh, I could learn from that, or like, oh, they, they're dope. Both. Okay. Yeah. That's Each awesome. person brings something to the table that I don't have. Mm -hmm. So that's why I think it's a great board. You have a an uncanny amount of awareness of yourself. <sighs> Thanks. Yeah, you like I don't know why. Sometimes like you'll say something, and I'll be like, "Is she a movie character? What kind of script is she reading from?" <laughs> you're like, you're like really aware. I'm like, oh, dang, I don't, I don't think I had that awareness this early in the process of when I started everything. Mm, I think it's just who I am. Like I'm always having conversations with myself, or like observing and analyzing and mm -hmm. reflecting, and so I'm like super insightful I think naturally mm -hmm. and then with therapy it just kind of enhanced it like you know the therapist is saying giving me tools mm -hmm. and now I'm utilizing those tools and now yeah. it makes me even more hyper aware so I think that's that's what you're witnessing yeah all right well this has been another episode of mental Health Monday here are my host Jory Jory it's welcome Jory. to the team oh I mean, that's cool. You could have dabbed me up or not. It was it was more like she right here, but I don't works. have a lot of practice with dabs. Can we do that again? Well, do you do you want? What, why are we thumb warring? I thought you said dab. That looked, that looked like competitive. Right there. I, was like, I thought we were dapping. I thought it was gonna do, be like. Do you, a... do you appreciate this dab? Do you have a a come in dab? Like, hey, it's good to see you. Do, you. do you have one of those tap dabs? So it's like, hey, man, it's, you've been great. <laughs> see you, like, you know. I don't dab. What I do is, can we do it this month? I don't do that. <laughs> I do the beginning, but that part I don't. I don't do those. That's. I've always looked at those and thought to myself, no, oh, no, 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 no. Oh, I have to practice that no. more. <laughs> I mean, I was, You have to do the explosion too. I'm not doing too. that. I am not doing that. All right, we'll that. just go I back. Just... We'll practice our dap off camera. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, <laughs> that's funny <laughs> anyway